So, uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to start uh, calculating the probability of error. Right? That's the that's the uh, I guess principal performance metric in in digital receivers. As you know, how does the receiver work? The receiver uh, does through two, goes through two steps. One, first step is demodulation and then detection. Demodulation, it will perform the projection of the incoming signal waveform along the basis vectors. And that's that's process that we understand it's 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 always the same. It is implemented either through a correlation receiver or through a uh, through a mesh filter. But then after you get these projections, then you have to make a decision. And this is the detection. And, and uh, that decision can be correct, in which case you are not making an error. Or decision can be incorrect, in which you can you are making an error. Meaning that you are uh, uh, declaring that it has been a different symbol that has been sent than the one that has actually been sent. And the probability of making the erroneous decision is used as a principal metric of, of uh, how good your receiver is behaving. It's uh, proportional to signal-to-noise ratio, but it's it's not the same thing, you know. Because uh, and we'll talk about what is the what is the difference there. So uh, let me draw a flow diagram of our starting point, and then kind of talk about how you actually calculate this probability of. So here is what we are working with. You have a transmitter. You have your SM of T. That's one of the symbols in your symbol set that you have uh, selected for the transmission. This gets corrupted with the noise, N of T, which is uh, additive white Gaussian noise. Then we have this demodulation that is performing, uh, that is taking this entire signal out of T here and projecting it on the basis vectors, and then you get this vector R that contains all the coordinates. We're going to pass this R into uh, detector, and we're going to get an estimate or decision on SN. And uh, this, as I said, can be correct or uh, correct or incorrect. Now let's uh, let's look at a little bit of math about what is happening along this process here. We already discussed that R is uh, uh, I guess R of t. That's the vector this guy here. Signal R of t is going to be S m of t plus uh, n of t, right? And uh, we can we say that this can be represented as sum when k goes from one to n, s n k times psi k of t, which is just saying that one, that my transmitted signal is filled out of my basis signals here. That's how I actually form my transmitted signal as a sum of of the basis uh, signals at the transmission point. But I can also understand my noise as sum k goes from 1 to n and k times um, <coughs> psi k of t and then plus some n prime of t. Okay. So my noise can be decomposed as well as a linear combination of these basis vectors but there will be some component of noise that is outside of the vector space spent by my, my basic basic vector psi k. <coughs> so this is sum when k goes from 1 to n r k, which is this uh, coordinate here. Let me just say r k times psi k of t, and then plus n prime of t, where this, uh, let me just say here, n prime of t is going to be your n of t minus sum when k goes from 1 to n, and k times psi k of t. Now, um, let's little talk about this for a, for a brief moment about this n prime of t. What, is, what does this 
that I present. Uh, let me go back to my analogy about the guy throwing a dart. Right? And let's look at this in a, a two-dimensional space. This is Psi 1 and this is <coughs> Psi 2. Now, this is my point SM. Right? SM is given as SM1 <coughs> times Psi 1, if I want to make these, these vectors, plus SM2 times Psi 2. Right? It's uh, the, the point in this two-dimensional space. Now, the, how do I determine this SM uh, k? It's going to be a, a dot product between uh, SM of t and psi k of t. Right? That's a projection uh, of, the, of the signal onto these, onto these basic signals. Now, in uh, my signals are chosen by my, chosen by a transmitter, right? So they are specifically chosen so that they are a linear combination of these basic signals. And there's nothing beyond them. Noise is not chosen that way. Noise is actually coming from a bigger space. What that means is there will be a projection of noise onto Psi 1, projection of the noise onto Psi 2, but, in, but after I subtract those two, there will still be some noise left, right? That noise is going to reside in a space that is orthogonal to the space that is spanned by Psi 1 and Psi 2. In other words, let's say we're in three-dimensional space. There is noise portion that will protrude this, this coordinate, noise that will protrude this coordinate, noise that will actually lift this out of the board, right? But as far as my decision-making process, since this noise component is in orthogonal space, it's not going to change my decision-making at all. Let's say my decision-making is very simple. Uh, this is, this is uh, let's say, QPSK. And I make a decision that everything that is within this quadrant, I'm going to call SM. The fact that this is coming out of the board this way doesn't matter much at all, because my decision boundary is here. So, what I'm trying to say is this n prime of t is not going to influence my decision making. So the only thing that will matter are the, the, the components of the noise that are along these basis vectors. Right? So I'm not going to even continue considering this anymore. I'm going to assume we neglect this. As a matter of fact, it's not going to even show up. I just know it's there because I'm writing the equations. But as far as what comes out of here, I'm going to get R1 and R2 R3, and this is not going to be even visible, just, uh, just uh, you know, the, the noise is going to manifest itself only along the coordinates that are, that are, that are spanning the space that I'm working with. So that's the first remark. The second remark is that somewhere in a, in a statistical theory or theory of stochastic signals, they teach you the following, following uh, result. If you have Gaussian noise, right? And you run that through a linear filter, which our demodulator is. Our demodulator is a matched filter, which is a linear filter. Uh, if you have a Gaussian process that goes through a linear filter, what is the result of it? Gaussian, Gaussian process. So, you so I know that this noise that comes out and corrupts this, N, uh, uh, this guy here, NK of T, is essentially Gaussian process. So once I know that it's Gaussian, then how many parameters do I need to characterize Gaussian process? Two. Two. I need to understand what is the mean value of this nk, and what's the standard deviation or variance or whatever, I, or autocorrelation function if, I, if, if uh, it's a band-limited Gaussian process. So let's uh, calculate those. So if I, if I go, what my goal here is going to be since everything is linear here, I have a superposition for a moment. I'm going to forget about the signal itself and concentrate on what happens at the output here as a result of this noise. And I already know that the process that is going to be at the output is going to be Gaussian as well. And what I need to determine is two parameters associated with it. One is going to be mean and the other one is going to be uh, variance or standard deviation. So. Uh, 
noise of the object. So this NK is going to be derived as a normal process, and it's going to have some mu K, mu K, and some sigma K. Right? So let's uh, determine what those are. Let's uh, determine expected value of NK, which is essentially the mean value of this process in the eye. And it's going to be expected value of integral from 0 to t n of t <coughs> times psi k of t dt, right? So that's, uh, that's uh, uh, what I have, right? Why? Because this, uh, what happens in this demodulator, I'm taking a dot product with whatever is the signal and my basis vector. And so that means I'm multiplying them and integrating them over interval t. Since Expected value and integration are both linear processes. I can exchange the two. And then this is a deterministic function, so it doesn't do anything to uh, uh, it, it, the expected operator does not change it, so the expected operator only operates on this n of t. So this becomes an integral from 0 to t, expected value of n of t times psi k of t dt. What is the expected value of n of t? Zero. zero. So the, the, this is equal to zero. So what does this tell me? This nk that is added to the coordinate, rk, because uh, here you can say that uh, uh, this rk, rk is equal to sm k plus nk. What is happening, this is what I'm what I'm sending, this is what I'm receiving, right? And the difference between those two is the noise. So this is S N, this is N, and this is R, right? So if I look at it now coordinate by coordinate, I can say that R1, which is the projection of this on the first vector, is going to be equal to S M1 plus N1. <coughs> And R2 is going to be SM2 plus N2, okay? Because, uh, you know, this noise here perturbed the originally transmitted signal into a new point, which is now this point, R. And it did that by taking every one of these coordinates and adding this NK. Now, what I've demonstrated here is the expected value of this NK is equal to zero. So, what that means practically is there is no preference, right? It is perturbing this coordinate equally, you know, in each direction uh, along these two, these two, uh, these, in each direction about the SM. So that's the first result. But let's take a look at the second result. And I'm going to look at the expected value of NK times NM. Right? I'm looking at the expected value between of the product between these two noises that appear at the output of, of two of the branches of, uh, of the correlating receiver. So this is equal to uh, expected value uh, of integral from 0 to t, n of t1 times psi 1 of t1, dt1. So that's the output of the, oh, no, psi 1, psi, psi k, right? This is the output of k correlator, this is nk. And then I'm multiplying that by integral from 0 to t, n of t2 times psi m of t2 times d t2. Right? So that's what, I, what I'm trying to determine. But again, using the same trick as before and realizing that these are linear <coughs> operators, I'm going to split this into double integral 0 to t, this is t1 goes from 0 to t, t2 goes from 0 to capital T, and then expected value of n of t1, n of t2, psi k of t1, psi m of t2, d t1, d t2. What did I do? I just brought in expected value psi here, 
but it only operates on these random processes here, not on the basis vectors, because basis vectors are deterministic. Now, what is this? This is a... This is a... A correlation, autocorrelation, right? And what do we know about this noise? It is white. So what is its autocorrelation function? Dirac, Dirac, Dirac pulse, right? Pulse. So, uh, so this integral here becomes, so let me write it here, expected value of nk times nm becomes integral from 0 to t, integral from 0 to t. This is t1 goes from 0 to t, t2 goes from 0 to t, and 0 over 2, delta of t1 minus t2, and then you have psi k of t times psi m of t dt1 dt2. Now this seems like a double integral, but it's not. It's a single integral that uh, where the subintegral function only exists when t1 is equal to t2. So now I can write this as n0 over 2 that goes outside. And uh, essentially 0 to t psi k of, this is t1, right? t1 and t2. Uh, let's say psi k of t times psi m of t dt. Uh, because you know, even though this is, or I can make it T1, so uh, T1 goes. Here's what is happening. You have a double integral where this is T1, this is T2. But the subintegral function only exists on this line, where T1 is equal to T2. So integrating outside of it is, is, is always zero. So instead of this double integral, I just have an integral when t1 is equal to t2, and that means t1 in both of these, and I'm just integrating uh, across along this line. Now let me ask you this, what is the value of this integral? It is equal to 1 if k is equal to m, and is equal to 0, where k is different than m. So this whole thing is equal to n0 over 2, where k is equal to m, and it's equal to 0 other ones, where k is different than m. So now, what does this mean? What is it that I'm looking here? I'm looking at the noise that comes at the output of two branches of your autocorrelation receiver, or correlating receiver. And what is it that, that I discover here? I discovered two things. First, the noises in different branches are uncorrelated. That's the, 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 the second assertion here, right? Because expected value of nk times nm, where k is different than m is equal to zero. There are, the noises in different branches are uncorrelated. And then the noise in the same branch, which is now expected value of nk times nk, which is uh, essentially variance, or, or second moment, but because of the mean equal to zero, this ends up being second central moment. The, the second central moment of the, or the variance is equal to n0 over 2. How large is the standard deviation? Square root of that. Square root of that, okay, just uh, <laughs> checking, right? So, this, so I have discovered the, the following thing, that expected value of nk is equal to zero, an expected value of nk squared is equal to n0 over 2. So th those are the, and then the third uh, result that we have derived is that the expected value of nk times nm is equal to 0 for k different than m. So these are all mathematical results. So what does this mean, uh, what does this mean you know, physically. How would I illustrate this? Uh, illustrate this so that we all understand what what these results actually <coughs> represent. So the best, you know, one of the easiest way to do that is go back to a guy throwing a dart. Let me just kind of draw what is happening. Let's say 
this is the point in constellation space. This is, uh, and I'm drawing the two-dimensional space because, you know, this is the, the one that uh, we're going to have the most applications in. This is the point of that I'm transmitting. So this is your SM. But as a result of the noise, you're going you're gonna to start seeing points surrounding this one, right? I, I tried to hit this, but because of the noise, here's where I hit. Or here's another one, here's another one. So I'm, I'm going to start uh, having all of these points that are creating a cloud around this constellation point. There will be a cloud, and the larger the noise is, the larger the cloud is going to be. Now, what do these results mean? If I look at one coordinate at a time, let's say I look at this first coordinate, and I look at the distribution across this coordinate, like where, how, what is the density if I project everything on this axis, what you'll end up with is this, right? On average, you're going to be right here, so there will be no bias, you know, in, in one direction versus the other, right? So you're going to, on average, you're going to be throwing right around this point, but there will be some equally number of points that are on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side. So what, what, where, how does this relate to the result? This is that E of n k equals 0. So on average, you're unbiased. <coughs> now, this sigma here is going to be equal to square root of n0 over 2. So the larger the n0 is, the larger the noise, the larger the sigma. So the larger my cloud is going to be. If n0 is very small, then my scatter of these points is going to be small, and my cloud is going to be tight. Now, that's the, that's that uh, the second point. But what does the third point mean? The third point means if I look at now this coordinate, the distribution along this coordinate is going to be the also Gaussian, but the, there will be no correlation between these two. So what does that mean? That means that this cloud here is going to be, how is it going to look like? It's going to be spherical. It's going to be a ball, right? It's, it's going to be a dance in the center and then kind of less dense towards the, towards the periphery. But there will be no, it will look the same way in every which direction I look. How would it look if, if, there was, if there's a correlation between? What would happen? You would get an ellipse of some sort. You would get an elongation. Let's say these two are completely correlated. Then what you'll end up with is something that looks like this. Okay? Whenever this one is, in, whenever I'm wrong this way, uh, I'm wrong this way too, let's say. So I end up always moving synchronously. No, that doesn't happen. You're, you're, based on all of these assumptions, your uh, dispersion here is a perfect speed, right? Because the coordinates are independent of each other. So, so now you can think about what is happening here. As, as, as you know, these Gaussian uh, guys have, have uh, infinite tails, right? That's a Gaussian distribution. So there is always some probability that you're going to throw the dart so that your offset is going to be this big, right? Or you're going to throw the dart that this offset is going to be this big. And what happens, you might fall in a in the area where your decision is going to be erroneous. All right, so that's the that's how you understand all this. Now let's uh, let's uh, uh, formalize this and actually uh, uh, actually uh, do some calculations. So just to generalize, just to kind of put this in, in one equation here, we're going to say something like this: n k is distributed normally with 0 and square root of n0 over 2, which means that PDF of nk is going to be equal to 1 over square root of 2 pi. Then here, it's a sigma. So it's going to be square root of n0 over 2, e to the minus nk minus mu, which is 0, squared over 2 sigma squared, right? And you can actually make this simplified somewhat. This 2 and 2 will cancel. And you end up that the PDF is equal to pi and 0 e to the 
minus nk squared over n0. So when k is going 1 to, to n, because we can have n basis vectors. So that's the probability density function associated with the noise coding, the one that you get at the output, right, that offsets your constellation point from where it needs to be. Okay? Now, to do our calculations of error, let me introduce some simplifying assumptions. You will see that uh, they are, they are, you know, uh, they're going to simplify our calculations tremendously, but they're not uh, far-fetched. You know, you will see that uh, from what we have covered so far, that they all that these assumptions make sense because we design our system so that they hold. Right. So we're going to make sure that uh, uh, they are actually satisfied. So first, let me kind of do simplifying assumptions. First simplifying assumption is that probability of SM is equal to 1 over N. So that all of my symbols are of an equal probability. Okay? Why did I say that this is not far-fetched? Because remember, what we do through our statistical encoding, we actually make sure that that's the case. And if our, unless our channel is somehow, uh, uh, somehow I, I should say, specific, that it favors certain symbols over certain other ones, really this is the best signaling scenario, right? You are optimizing your capacity. So that's, uh, that's what we're going to assume here. And what that will do is, is will, it will allow us to simplify the decision-making process. So I guess let me put this. Symbols are, are equally probable or equiprobable. And uh, under this assumption, with our decision-making process becomes something that we call maximum likelihood. which is the easier of the two, but we're going to restrict ourselves in this course to just maximum likelihood. So that's one uh, assumption. The second assumption, simplifying assumption, is decision is made, is made on the basis, on basis of Euclidean distance. Symbol by symbol. Okay. The first one that we are using Euclidean distance is the consequence of the, the this that all the symbols are equiprobable. Let me illustrate why why uh, what what why is that the case? Let's look at the converse. Let's say that the symbols are not equiprobable. And let's say that majority of time I have four symbols here. And then let's say 99% of the time I'm sending this one. Right? So, and, and the, let's say the symbol fall, the, the thing falls here, the dart falls here. If 99% of the time I'm sending this one, what would the decision be? Yeah, it, it is here, but I'm probably better off assuming that it's this. Then, uh, then that this is this is the guy. So you see what happens in that case. Your decision boundary moves in favor of the one that is more probable, right? If I'm sending more and more, almost this one almost all the time, then my decision boundary is kind of going to be like here. And it's not until I throw it here that I say, okay, wait a minute, it's probably this one, right? It's unlikely, but it's probably that one. Now, if the, if the symbols are equiprobable, then where, where are your decision boundaries? Right in the middle, right? And then your decision-making process becomes very simple. Whichever is the closest one to where the doubt fell, that's the one that I'm going to assign. Right? So that's a, that this, is, this is the best strategy if this one is, uh, if this is the case. Right? So that simplifies it 
to us uh, a little, uh, quite a bit. The second one is a little bit, this is the only one that I put on the board that is not, uh, I would say, not most, not used most common. Right? This, is, this is what we try to make through the design. And then if you make this, this is the best way of assigning symbols. But here, what I'm saying is, I'm making a decision, a symbol by symbol time. Every time I get the dart, I, ha I have to make a decision which one out of the possible symbols was, uh, was sent. And in majority of systems that we have in use today, that's not the case. Uh, why is that? Because we use error control coding. And what error control coding does, it introduces redundancy in your symbol strings. Right? Not all, uh, all uh, sequence of symbols is equally probable. And the best way to explain this, think about uh, sending a text. Text is uh, redundant, right? It, it carries thoughts, and, and it's not just a random number of symbols. It carries certain redundancy with it, right? So now, uh, symbol by symbol is I'm receiving every symbol, and I'm making decision on that particular symbol every time I receive it. You sense intuitively that if there is a redundancy in the text, there's some gain to be made or to be uh, leveraged by waiting for words, right? And even if you miss a couple of letters, you can still recognize the word because there is some redundancy. That redundancy in communication is, is uh, introduced to error control coding, most, most commonly convolutional encoding. And there is a benefit to not encode symbol by symbol, but rather to wait for a longer sequences before you make a decision. That kind of decoding is usually done through Viterbi decoder, and I'm sure you've heard of it, right? But the, that complicates some of the process, so just be aware of it, and we're going to treat it in some, some other courses. But since this is an introductory course, I'm going to introduce this simplifying assumption, right? And then we're going to treat this uh, mathematically. And in terms, in terms of where does this, where does this um, puts us, it's pretty much uh, looking at the worst case scenario, right? It's your raw symbol rate. And then, you know, there's some gains on the top of it that you're going to achieve through using error control coding that, uh, that uh, uh, we'll, we'll treat in some other course. So let's just assume now that we're doing symbol by symbol, but be aware that most of the time it's not done symbol by symbol, but rather looking at the sequence of symbols be, be, before the decision is is made. There is obvious trade-off in terms of delay. You have to wait for several symbols before you make a decision. But uh, I guess we'll consider that some other time. So these are the two uh, 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 simplifying assumptions. Let's just uh, put the decision-making criteria. We're going to look at distance between R and SM as a decision-making criteria. What is R? R is the actual location of the point after it goes to a demodulator. And SM are all the constellation points in where M can go now from 1 to all the way to the M. And uh, the easiest way to understand this, I'm going to calculate the distance between the receive point and all possible constellation points. And whichever distance is the smallest, my decision is going to be that's the constellation point that has been sent. Right. How do I calculate distance? Well, I'm going to define it as a norm of this guy. And uh, uh, that's, that's the, I guess, easiest way to define it. But to not calculate the square root, I'm actually going to make the distance on a norm square. Because right? if, if, uh, if uh, uh, number is smaller than some number, other number, the square of that number is also uh, smaller than the square of that other number. And when we calculate distance, you remember you have to do the square root of the difference of the coordinates. So why do square root? You know, if, 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 if I calculate the square of the distances to all the constellations and pick the smallest square, I'm already there. 
I don't have to calculate the square root. So even though I said Euclidean distance, we're going to actually base the decision on the square of Euclidean distance. So and this is going to be sum when k goes from 1 to n, smk minus rk squared. OK? So, uh, so that's one way of making decisions. There are a couple of alternative ways that we can deploy, and let me just go through them. They're ex essentially equivalent to this one, but they are slightly uh, more efficient computationally. So let, let's just look at a couple of other metrics that, uh, as I said, in, in, in uh, essence are Euclidean, but uh, are maybe slightly easier to compute. So if I look at now this D of R and SM, and I start by saying this is sum when k goes from 1 to n, SMK minus RK magnitude squared. But then I uh, decompose this, so this becomes sum when k goes from 1 to n, RK squared minus 2 times sum rk, smk, k goes 1 through n, and plus sum when k goes from 1 to n, smk. What did I do? Square. What did I do? Nothing smart. I just took this and I decomposed that into, into individual terms. Now, in terms of decision-making process, what is this first part? This is the norm square of r, right? The first one, because it's sum of the R RK coordinates. So this is the distance of the R from the origin, and then squared. The other, this guy here, is 2 times of R transpose times SM. And then this is the norm of SM squared, as I identify three individual terms. Remember what our goal is. Our goal is to evaluate this distance and then pick the one that's the smallest. Now, if I, if I change m, you can see that this term stays the same. It represents the constant offset on all different distances. So this will not contribute to, uh, it will not change my decision which one is the smallest, because it's the, this term exists in every single one of them. Right? It's a DC offset. So I don't have to calculate this. Right? And so I can devise a different metric, let me call it d prime, that I'm going to say is minus 2 times r transpose times sm plus sm magnitude squared. And then you realize, well, this one is, can be pre-computed, right? Because that, that is always the same. That does not depend on r. It doesn't depend what I've received. So I can pre-compute these guys. And all I need to do is do the dot product between whatever is that received signal is and the constellation points in my in my space, right? And uh, so I guess here let me just put this here. SM maybe pre-computed. And then in case um, uh, let me define another metric, uh, C, I guess, here, of this is d prime of R and SM. Now, I can define another metric, C prime of R and SM, that is just um, 2 times R transpose SM minus SM magnitude squared. So here I'm, I'm going to pick the minimum across uh, uh, across m. So I'm going to pick the symbol that has a minimum of this, or I can pick a maximum of this, right? Across. And then the last thing that I can say, well, if norm of SM 
is constant, which modulation scheme I'm, I'm, I'm talking about here? If all of your constellation symbols have the same node. Phase shift keying, right? Because all of the phase shift keying symbols are the same. Then this is constant across all symbols. So this is PSK. Then I can introduce another, which is just R transpose times SM. And I'm going to look at for the maximum of this. All right, so let's say, let's say I'm sending QPSK, and then I receive R. So how do I make the decision? I do four dot products. I take R with dot product with the first, dot product with the second, dot product with the third and fourth, and then I pick the one which is largest, right? You follow, that's the, that's the easiest way. So dot products are very easy to do in, in, uh, in uh, they, they don't require anything but uh, multiplication and addition. So you can really quickly decide which one out of four possible symbols was actually sent. Okay? Now, all of these are equivalent, and I just want to point them out here. We're going to actually, since we're doing math, we're going to stick to this one. You know, they're all equivalent to that. This is just uh, so that you are aware that there are different ways how we can do the decision making. Uh, in the actual situations to minimize the computational load on our on our receiver. All right, so let's uh, move towards the goal of this whole uh, story here, and this is calculation of the probability of error. Let me first define it, and uh, once we define it, then then we look into different modulation schemes that we talked about and try to. Calculate it. And what you will see is there is limited number of cases where we can do that analytically, but doing this in uh, uh, using simulations is very, very easy task. So I will later, I'll probably next time, I'm going to give you some code that will allow you to uh, determine these uh, probabilities of error just by simulating you know, using MATLAB or, or similar. similar Simulation too. Hey, Doctor Kostenik. Mm -hmm. But since we used the mash filter in the beginning, why don't we just take the one that came out with the highest energy in the mash filter? Okay. Um, uh, think about it. What 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 uh, you will, right? But here's what what your what uh, uh, you are having. Um, um, every signal is a mixture of, of your basis signals. So if I send a signal, there will be two outputs uh, out of the mesh filter, each one representing a coordinate. So you cannot just pick the higher one. You're just what you're... Let me, let me just... That's a, that's a very, you know, very common... Question. common point of confusion. So let's let's just look at what happens. This is where your R comes in, R of T, that contains your signal plus noise. <coughs> your match uh, or your correlating receiver will do this. Psi 1 of T and this will do Psi 2 of T. So what comes here? It's R1, R2. Okay? So they can be, one can be larger and one can be smaller or any possible combination. But what is actually happening? This is, this is your R. And what you're doing is you're projecting this. So this is your R1 and this is your R2. So which one is larger, which one is smaller, is not that important. What, what the combination of R1 and R2 gives you is the point in this constellation space. And then what we are really looking for is the closest, you, you know that you're not signaling with the whole space. You're signaling uh, using the discrete points in this space, right? So you're now actually looking at which one is closer to the, to the one that I have obtained. So you have to keep the both. 
both of them, right? See that? Uh, I do, uh, but it, I mean, we could just do sine multiplication plus times plus is top right, right? If this yeah. one axis. Okay, okay. But let, let me do this. What, what are you going to do now? <clears throat> we could uh, just still do the same thing, the sine of psi 1 times the sine of psi 2 will give you... Sine of psi 1 yeah. is going to be 1. Sine of psi 2 is equal to 1. So 1 times 1 is 1. Well, so, be so which one out of this constellation? Well, top right is plus... Top right? Yeah. Why? Why isn't, it, why isn't it this one? Maybe it's closer to that one, right? Maybe I said actually... You, you see what I'm saying? Like, it doesn't have to be the top right. You know, this one will also have 1 plus 1, right? Sine of psi 1 is going to be 1. Sine of psi 2 is going to be 1. But, but it's actually this that was sent, right? If there's more than, yeah, if there's more than 4. And well, there's more than 4. I mean, I'm just frequently drawing 4 because this gives me two-dimensional space with a minimum number. So I can draw other stuff, right, and not plot the image. But if you have a 64 quam, then you have you have 16 of points in this quadrant alone, mm -hmm. and you cannot just say okay it's in this quadrant and you still have a 16 possibilities. You know where you need to decide which out of the 16 points. Mm -hmm. The the product of the signs decides which quadrant, and in case of QPSK that's that's sufficient because there's one point in each quadrant. Mm -hmm. But in higher order modulation scheme. Once you decide which quadrant it is, you still have some decision making to do, and you have you cannot just rely on the sign. Mm. Right. Okay. So let's define probability of error. Let's see what probability of error is formally, and then we need to calculate. and I'm going to again work with a two-dimensional space but make sure you generalize this at least in your mind you know because this is just an example it doesn't you know. okay so here's what what happens I'm, I'm sending this point uh, sending this point at the transfer and what I'm receiving here is a cloud right it's a two-dimensional space so the Distribution across each one of these coordinates is Gaussian with a zero mean and standard deviation, which is square root of n0 over 2. So now, let me consider this. Consider this probability density function. Probability density function of R given that I have sent Sn. How does this probability density function look like? What this density function tells me is what is the probability density at any given point in this two-dimensional space. And it kind of, the height of, you can think of it as a, let me do this mild experiment. Imagine that I pinch the board here and then I pull it out, right? So what does that do? It tells me that, pro, that the cloud is the densest here and then it kind of gets sparser and sparser as you move. Uh, away and a uh, couple of things you know uh, why is it why is it the densest in the middle because it's unbiased right the expected value of nk is equal to zero why is it symmetric because I have two two independent variables of one another noises in two branches are independent and how fast does the do the skirts go into the board is dependent on the noise if the noise is small then I pull it this out and it's very spiky, right? If the noise is large, then I just barely pull it and it's kind of leveling off in a slow manner, right? The area under the curve is always one, right? So if it's if it's wider, then it's then it's uh, uh, how should you say less tall, shorter. 
So that's that's pictorial. Let me try to write this in a in a in some uh, equations here. Since these two coordinates are independent of each other, then their joint probability density function is going to be product of their margin of their individual. So it's going to be k goes from 1 to n pdf of rk given smk. In other words, what I'm saying here is I can see this joint probability function as the product of individual ones where I'm looking each individual chord. And if I write this, this becomes product when k goes from 1 to n. I know the individual one. Individual one we just derived, it is 1 over square root of pi n0 e to the minus nk squared over n0. So this is how this guy looks like. When, k, when n is equal to 2, then I have product of two Gaussian distributions, right? That are, you know, uh, uh, kind of meaning at this point here. One Gaussian is across this coordinate, and the other one is this coordinate. And what you end up with is this really bell, three-dimensional bell curve, right? With this, that is centered around, the, around this point. Now, uh, so what happens here is every one of these points, let's call this SM, to every one of these points, I can uh, partition this entire two-dimensional space, or in, in general case, n-dimensional space, into two regions. Let me call, do it this way. And I'm going to call this region Rm, and the rest of it I'm going to call Rm complete. So how is my decision-making process working? If my point falls within the Rm, I'm going to make the decision that it was Sm that was sent. Okay? And if, it, if the point falls within RMC, I'm going to make the decision that it was not SM that was sent. So what is my probability of error? It's going to be probability that the dart falls within this region given this probability density function. So it's going to be a volume underneath this surface that is outside of RM. Right, because the volume, what is the total volume underneath this surface? It's equal to 1. And volume underneath this surface uh, in, that is within the decision boundary, that's probability of making a correct mistake, a correct, correct decision, right? Probability of making a mistake is going to be the volume underneath this surface that is in a complement of the decision boundary. So, probability of error, given that SM is sent, is going to be integral over RM complement of PDF of R given SM D, uh, DR. And I just realized you should have warned me. This is not correct, right? Right? What should be here? Need an S M K. Yeah, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be R K minus S M K squared. That's a dispersion. You have a you have a normal distribution that's centered around S M K. Because what S M K since n uh, expected value of n is zero, S M K actually offsets this distribution to the to uh, to, uh, to this coordinate here. Right? So this is SN1 and this is SN2. In the absence of a signal, where does where does this move? So this cloud. Where does this cloud move in the absence of the signal? In yeah, the origin, right? Because you have just noise and it's it's here. And then when you when you send the signal, this cloud moves here, 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 you know. As, as you, what, what SM does, it moves the cloud and centers it around the given symbol. But can we still use N0? Yes, because N0 is the, is the uh, magnitude of the dispersion. 
This Persian is the same. It kind of tells you how wide this, this bell is. In absence of the signal, bell is here. But if I send a signal, bell moves and centers around the signal. But the width of the bell, the shape of the bell is the same. Right? That's, uh, so, you, you can. so now, what is the probability of error? Probability is I look at this bell and I calculate what is the volume outside. Because I, I know I'm signaling here. And if, let's say, if my N0 is so small, this, this is a very narrow, so I'm never making a mistake. But if my signal is, uh, my noise is large, N0 is large, then this, there is bleeding of this sort of probability into <coughs> regions that are, that are complementary to your decision-making bound. So that's where you're going to be making mistakes, making an error. And probability of error given SM is the integral over complement of your decision boundary over this PDF. But that's just sending SM. The average probability of making error, average probability of error, I'm going to say probability of error is going to be some when m goes from 1 through m, probability of error given sm times the probability of sm. Right? So that's in general. But you know, we introduce our simplifying assumption that says that these probabilities are the same, right? Probability of every symbol. So this becomes sum when m goes from 1 to m. 1 over m times probability of error given sm. So this is 1 over m sum when m goes, little m, sorry, m goes from 1 to capital M integral rmc pdf R given SM. Now, in some cases, this is these are the same. So then you end up like in the case of QPSK, there is no reason to assume that the probability of error for this one is any different than the probability of error for this one. Probability, of error. but in some cases, these are not the same. So we should we could leave it this way. And a lot of times, we can actually this is the definition of probability of error. A lot of times, it is actually easier to calculate it this way. Sum m goes from 1 to m as 1 minus integral over rm now, pdf of r given sm dr, which, what is this? What is this? If the integral over complement of the decision boundary is probability of error, if I integrate within the decision boundary, what do I get? Probability of success, of a correct decision. So 1 minus that gives me probability of error. So it's the same, but a lot of times the shape of the decision-making boundary makes it easier maybe to integrate either this way or that way. So we're going to be using either one of them, whichever one is more convenient from the integration standpoint. So at this point, we're done. Right, that's it. Right, that's what we need to calculate. Right? And uh, conceptually, it's very easy to understand what you're doing. Right, you are having, you're throwing the darts. They are coming with as, as clouds here, and all you need to do is formulate this cloud. And you have the formulation almost here given in analytical form. And what I need to do is go through my constellation and carefully integrate this, evaluate these integrals. In this day and age, this is relatively easy task because we love to integrate you know if we can do it analytically it's fine if we can do it numerically it's fine too because integration is a very stable process right we don't uh, we don't uh, uh, think twice about integrating something well, most of the time integrating something numerically because it's relatively easy to do uh, but what you will find out even though conceptually it's very easy to do you know we can do that analytically in just few examples. And, and these few examples are in every book, and I'm going to go through them here. But then we're going to reach the end of these examples, and then what I'll 
do is I'll have to teach you how you actually do this, you know, in cases where your constellations are complicated and, and these decision boundaries are not easy. And uh, it is, again, relatively easy. All you need is maybe 10, 15 lines in MATLAB and just let it run for a little while and then you get uh, these probabilities of errors. But uh, let's take a look at, uh, uh, at least we're going to start today, or maybe not. Huh? What do you think? No, huh? <laughs> 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 uh, mm? um, okay, so let's let's stop here. So what we have next time is a review, right? Mm -hmm. And then the, the midterm is on, on Thursday. So I'll put together some problems for review. You go through all the examples and uh, homework assignments, come up with questions, and we'll do the review next time. So you mostly you're covering chapter seven? Yeah, well, it, I'll have to include some previous material because there's not enough you know, in chapter mm -hmm. seven. So we'll do, I'll, I'll come up with something uh, by next time I actually bound it. So where, from where to where is the testing going? So there will be some overlap. By, by next Tuesday? Yeah. Next Tuesday is review. Yeah. I'm going to actually spend a whole lecture just reviewing material. But when are you going to bound it? Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> Too late? Thursday morning, yeah. <laughs> Thursday morning, you'll be the notice. Okay. Well, we, we don't have any lectures in between. Yeah. Okay, can you just email, email or something? Okay, I'll try to do that. I'll email, I'll email the whole class. So check your email. Okay.